Warmly welcome to this dialogue on development research. Today, we are happy to discuss one of the major or one of the many challenges we are facing, not the least in the developing world with fast growing cities and fast growing populations. And we are really happy to have Tatu Mwang Limumba here to talk about the pursuit of modern city and affordable housing lessons from Dar es Salaam. Uh, she will be introduced a bit later by today's moderator, Nelson Ekane. I'm Jonas Evald, and I'm a senior lecturer at Peace and Development Studies at Linnaeus University and a member of the board of Swedish Development, the Swedish SWEDEV, the Swedish Development Association, the Swedish Development Research Association. Uh, and this dialogue series that we are trying to establish is something that is occurring on a regular basis since Sweden was initiated some three years ago in 2019. So this seminar is organized together jointly between Sweden and the development and aid policy team at uh, Stockholm Environment Institute, which Nelson Ekane will present briefly later. But just to say some, some words about the Sweden, <clears throat> the Sweden network, aim to bring together development researchers in different academic environments in Sweden to facilitate contacts, building networks, facilitating <clears throat> exchange of ideas, and of course, in front of all, linking up in between different research environments, as well as to policymakers or civil society organizations working in a similar field. So this, this seminar series is an important part of that work, trying to establish a platform for exchange of important perspectives on challenging issues. Um, and of course, it's really important not only to bring together development researchers, but also pra development practitioners of various kinds. We have a lot of things to learn from each other. <clears throat> uh, and today we target one of the challenging issues that we are facing, urbanization. And um, Nelson Ekane will a little bit later introduce today's speaker, Tatum Twangi Lim Bumba. But just before I left, hand over the word to him, I just like also to promote you to link in to the Sweden homepage. We try to publish news of various kinds there. And you could, there's also a possibility to register yourself as a member or as a what type of research that you are doing and look for other people who could share the interest that you also have. Okay, thank you very much. I hand with this over to Nelson Ekam. Thanks a lot, Jonas. Um, I warmly welcome you all uh, to this dialogue uh, on development research. Um, my name is Nelson Ekane, I'm a research fellow uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute within the Development and Aid Policy team. Uh, and I will be moderating this session. Uh, uh, just some background, um, the Development and Aid Policy team that John has mentioned at the Stockholm Environment Institute was formed in September 2022 uh, as a response to an internal project looking at the development dimensions of SCI's work. So SCI has a dual mandate uh, covering both development and environment. However, our work on environment has taken precedence. Uh, and as such, uh, the Institute is mainly recognized as an environment uh, think tank. So the development and aid policy team uh, is raising the profile of uh, the development aspects of SCI's work and is linking with partners and networks having similar research and development agenda. Uh, at the local and global levels. So um, that said, uh, we are pleased to introduce our first speaker uh, from the Global South, uh, Dr. Tatu Twangi Limbumba. Tatu is a senior research fellow at the Institute of Human Settlement Studies at Adi University in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Tatu has a PhD in Build Environment Analysis and specializes in housing, informality, and urban poverty. 
She has participated in research activities both locally and regionally in subjects related to urban service delivery, climate change, and housing. Adi University is a member of the International Network on Quality of Government and Water and Sanitation Outcomes. This network is led by SEI and was created with funding from FOMAS. Uh, Tato will talk uh, on the post of a modern city and affordable housing in Tanzania. Um, the African city is most often defined uh, by what they lack, uh, lack of water, lack of sanitation, lack of housing, lack of resources, lack of democracy, lack of urbanity, etc., and characterized by informality, insecurity, inequality in all its forms. The cities are also described as ultra-modern uh, to refer to hybrid nature and heading in an unknown uh, direction uh, or directions. The complex conditions in African cities require an open discussion of past and current urban planning practices, as well as future reforms. And I think that sets the background for uh, Tattoo's uh, presentation. So Tattoo will examine the challenges related to access to affordable housing and the tensions likely to rise uh, between policy and local practices in the case of the city of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. We're meeting the needs uh, for affordable housing, particularly for the poor uh, in terms of rental and owner uh, occupied, uh, still remains elusive even amidst increased government-led housing programs. So in, in terms of structure, Tattoo will present for 25 minutes uh, after which a discussion will follow. Um, and please do note all questions and comments in the question and answer window. And these questions will be directed to Tatu when the time comes. So Tatu, please, uh, I will hand the word to you uh, to maybe say a brief intro of yourself, uh, things that I've missed, and then go right into your presentation. Over to you, Tatu. Um. Thank you, Jonas and uh, Nelson, um, for the introduction. I must say I'm uh, very happy to be here, and I'd like to thank uh, the Swedish Development Research Network and the Swedish Environmental Institute um, for giving me this opportunity to participate uh, in this dialogue and to be able to uh, engage in conversations with practitioners, policymakers, um, and even ordinary people from uh, from all over the world, so to speak. Um, so to the rest of the participants, I can say good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, uh, wherever you are. And uh, I'd like to present to you um, my presentation titled The Pursuit um, of a Modern City and Affordable Housing um, in Tanzania. So there you have a picture of uh, the skyline of Dar es Salaam city, and I'm sure some of you can uh, sort of relate to the city. Next. So I'll begin my presentation by uh, giving you a small introduction. Um, the information, most of the information for this dialogue and for this presentation has been obtained um, from my research, which was on social cultural aspects of informal settlements, which I also did at KTH Stockholm. Um, I also uh, obtained some information and research on co-production approaches, um, research on climate change and nature-based solutions to mention a few, uh, as well as findings from other studies that have been carried out on African cities with a view to reconciling conflicting planning and urban realities on the ground. Um, Nelson has mentioned this um, during his introductory remarks. Next. Uh, so when we talk about urbanization in Africa, um, cities are experiencing unprecedented urbanization, and this is not matched with significant economic performance, unlike some of the cities um, in the West. Now, as a result, we have informality and urban poverty as an everyday reality, and it is estimated that by 2050, uh, most of the countries in African cities will have more than 50% of their population living in urban areas. 
Now, this phenomena is manifested quite starkly in uh, informal settlements and informal uh, economy where, for instance, over 80% of the employment uh, is in informal and many persons work in precarious environments. Next. Um, now, when we have these high population growth rates and we also have unmet demands for housing, both rental and owner. And as a result, people are compelled to live in informal, uh, in these informal settlements. Now, unfortunately, these settlements are inadequate. They comprise substandard housing. They also have poor infrastructure services, such as water and sanitation. But despite um, the gloom, these are settlements that support the livelihoods of many of the poor people living in sub-Saharan African cities. And we are told that about 4.5 million new residents uh, move to these areas each year. Another challenge is that most of these settlements are located in very risky locations, prone to flooding and some other um, calamities. Next, please. So with all the challenges in our cities, how do we achieve inclusive, safe and sustainable cities? Um, some people have it that urban plans have been seen as the key to achieving inclusive, safe and sustainable cities, but then they are not working. On the other hand, other researchers say that urban planning has done less to include the poor. And actually when you have master plans, they sweep the poor away from the main city. And as, and as a result, these master plans, if not guided carefully, can be exclusionary. Next, please. Now, um, the guides and the plans and the master plans that we're talking about, um, they often contradict the African urban reality of local residents. Because in these master plans, sometimes we have zoning, uh, the zone urban residential areas that are in high, medium, and low density. So sometimes you see that um, poor people cannot afford to live in these areas, and they're sometimes forced to live on the outskirts of the city. Sometimes these master plans have visions for future cities which reflect images of Europe, Asian and Arab cities. And this has been uh, suggested by some researchers. Now, the question is how we can, how can we reconcile the two visions? If need be, we may need to reconcile the two visions, but maybe we might need to follow a path of our own without excluding the majority of the populations, most of whom are poor. Next, please. So now I'm going to talk about Dar es Salaam city. This is the city where I live and it's the city that I'm most familiar with. Um, Dar es Salaam is the largest city in Tanzania. It's about three times the second city, which is Mwanza in terms of population. And according to the uh, Dar es Salaam master plan, which is for 2012, 2020, 2032, the city population is increasing by about 226,000 people per year and is doubling every 20 years. By 2025, it is projected that the city will accommodate about 6.2 million people. And these are some studies by the African Development Bank that have shown this projection. However, we, we did our recent census here in Tanzania and uh, it was launched, the results were launched by the President of the United Republic of Tanzania, uh, Mama Samia Slu Hassan. And uh, this population census puts the city's population at about 5.3 million people, which is about 8.7% of the total population of, the, uh, of Tanzania, of the country in general. Next, please. Okay, so here we have a picture of Dar es Salaam. This is the city we envisioned to have. 
um, a very nice, aesthetically pleasing uh, city with good transportation systems, uh, high rise buildings and affordable, good high standard housing, including uh, access to uh, water supply services and so on. Next, please. Um, the next slide that is coming up is trying to show um, a comparison of the cities we envision and the kind of city that we have now. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so this next slide shows uh, the urban reality. And I'm sure that it's not only reflected in Dar es Salaam, but it's also reflected in many of the cities. Um, many of the African cities. Um, now, just to recall the pictures, it shows that about 27 of the population in, is densely populated in informal settlements in Dar es Salaam. Um, we have climate change impacts such as flooding in these informal areas because they are located in risky locations. Um, but then, like I said earlier, it's not all doom. People are able to build their own houses incrementally. Um, where water is not available, then people improvise in terms of buying water or getting water from a public uh, tap. Unfortunately, the environments are very risky and sometimes you have overcrowding. Next, please. Um, this slide is a bubble uh, illustration to try and show all the uh, problems that, that we have in our cities. Um, but I can say that these settlements are socially and economically supportive of the everyday lives of the 70% um, of the population in Dar es Salaam. We have 70% living in informal settlements, but we also have another 30% living in, in formal planned settlements. Now, my focus would be on the 70% of the population in Dar es Salaam um, and the kind of responses that have been done to meet the problems and the challenges in order to make livable cities. Next, please. So uh, in terms of the kind of selected responses to the challenges, uh, since I'm going to be talking about housing, we have um, public government-led housing to try and meet the demand for housing. Now, this kind of housing is funded uh, by local agency, a local institution, but we also have external finance in terms of uh, loans from banks. We also have um, community cooperative housing. These are also local initiatives. They are also externally financed by um, international organizations and NGOs. We have self-built, self-produced housing individually. And these are most of these are individually financed, but we also have um, examples of community-led settlement infrastructure upgrading that is locally and externally financed. So, here I'm trying to, 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 to show you um, a snapshot of some selected um, responses that try to uh, ameliorate some of the challenges that are faced um, in our urban areas. Next, please. Next. Uh -huh. Um, so we have, uh, like I said earlier, the public-led housing construction. Um, this type of construction of housing uh, is meant to meet the needs, affordable and construct affordable housing units. These are done by uh, a public agency here called the National Housing Corporation. They build housing for sale. And in 2019, they built uh, some houses and all of them were sold. These are low cost affordable houses. The lowest selling price uh, for these houses were about $23,000. Uh, 
but well, they are largely unaffordable, even for a salaried lower middle income household, unless you're able to acquire a mortgage. And that means you need to have a regular salary in order to service the mortgage. But they, they are compatible with middle income lifestyles of which many people aspire to, to live. These are contractor built housing, most often in peri urban locations, green fields, and sometimes they're disconnected and away from, uh, from the jobs. Next, please. So you can see how they are aesthetically very, very uh, pleasant looking. But we also have public led mixed use housing construction. Um, these target the high end market. Um, this is a, the picture shows an example of Victoria Place, which is in Dar es Salaam. The motto here is you deserve a home, not a house. Um, this Victoria Place has uh, five types of residential apartments and they cost between $100,000 to $370,000. Um, the apartments contain facilities such as shopping malls, playgrounds, facilities, and uh, office accommodation. An interview with one of the um, national housing uh, officials says, well, it's like a new city. This project will entirely change the surroundings of actually the surroundings of that um, road. So this is quite modern looking. Next, please. And the next slide was, shows you a community-led delivery of affordable land and housing. Um, this is uh, housing at community level. It's Chamazi and it's in the peri-urban outskirts of Dar es Salaam. Um, this project emerged from a need to house tenants. Um, these tenants were didn't have a place to go when their area was demolished to pave way for urban infrastructure that is port expansion. And you know, when you have uh, houses are maybe demolished to give way to expansion, homeowners are usually compensated, but sometimes tenants are also left vulnerable. So their livelihoods were disrupted. So what happened is they came together, they formed a cooperative and with technical support and guidance uh, from a community led organization, these people uh, the, the residents were able to collectively save money and purchase land in the outskirts of the city. Now the land that they purchased, the plot sizes were small and matching some of the incomes and the savings that they had. And um, they also had assistance from national and international NGOs, for instance, the um, Tanzania uh, Federation for Urban Poor, Slum Dwellers uh, uh, Investment, so they had um, uh, financing from these international NGOs. This cooperative prepared a master plan for that area and designated land for social and livelihood activities. So at this very local level, they were able to uh, make their own area for living. Next, please. Um, this one also is continues to show um, this uh, program that I'm talking about. Um, the houses were built by the community themselves. Uh, women played a very significant role in the activities and in the housing cooperatives. The construction costs were lowered uh, and incremental housing construction process was used. There was self-development of building materials uh, like bricks, and so this helped to lower the costs of construction. The plot sizes were also smaller than the national urban planning uh, standards. Next, please. Um, the, this next slide shows uh, individual self built housing. So you can see this is quite a, a, a divergence from the other uh, housings that were either government-led or community-led, cooperative-led. About 90% of the current housing stock in Dar es Salaam is self-built. Many, many people in Dar, whether they're informal 
or formal residential areas build their houses themselves over a very long period of time, sometimes five to 10 years. And majority of housing is built this way and people use their own savings, depends on the incomes that you have, or they borrow from microcredit facilities. Now the government has promoted this kind of self-built housing in the spirit of self-help. And the only challenge is that sometimes the construction needs to be guided um, to address the issues of substandard housing, or uh, building these houses in risky environments, especially if the environments are informal, and also looking at health risks that are related to substandard housing. However, we know that such an approach of building incrementally provides a strong market for housing microfinance uh, processes or facilities. Next, please. Uh, most of us in Dar es Salaam build this way incrementally. So now I'm going is the community as an example of a community-led basic infrastructure improvement. Um, like I said earlier, we have large uh, infrastructure improvement uh, projects going on in Dar es Salaam, but we also have these small uh, community-based infrastructure improvement in informal settlements. Now this is a settlement called Hananasif. It was improved quite a number of years ago, almost 25 years ago. Uh, it used to flood during rainy seasons, but I'm using this example because it is an example where the improvement was done using labor intensive technology. Now, many projects that are currently uh, being done here in the city use contractor-based approaches. And sometimes when you use contractor-based approaches, you deny residents the opportunity to work and improve their livelihoods, residents who live in those areas. But this project in Handanasif used the residents, including women from the area um, to improve the settlements. So in other words, apart from having their area improved, the livelihoods were also improved because they were able to earn um, some income as laborers in these uh, construction projects. Next, please. Um, so now I'm going to talk about financing these urban uh, development uh, initiatives. Uh, often local governments lack the financial resources to significantly implement interventions related to housing development. That's why sometimes you see um, some of these interventions are done by people themselves, for instance, building housing or improvement of uh, housing areas. These are done uh, by people themselves. Now, um, the share of national budgets to housing issues is minimal. Over here, uh, I had a graph that shows um, the share of housing um, subsidies uh, by the government, and this is very small. It doesn't go beyond 10% um, of the uh, national budget into housing, mm. for instance. Sorry, Tatu, that graph uh, doesn't show. Uh, maybe we tap again to see if it appears. Okay. It hasn't appeared. Now it... Okay, so it's, yeah, it's there now. So this graph uh, is to show the government budget dedication to housing subsidies. Um, we can see that um, the amount of money dedicated to housing is quite um, small. Um, in 2019 to 2020, indeed, um, the allocation was small and that was because of the COVID-19, uh, the, the pandemic where most of the budgets went to um, addressing the effects of the pandemic. But nevertheless, it shows um, a very small amount of money by the government is put into the housing sector, unlike money that might be put in the health or the education uh, sector. However, Dar Islam is witnessing the development of large infrastructure projects. Most of these are financed by development partners. Indeed, development partners are estimated to at 11% of the total national budget. And they do play an important role where um, local governments are financially constrained. Next, please.
I'm not sure that this is very clear, but this one is uh, an illustration or an example of selected projects that are being done in infrastructure, large infrastructure projects that are changing the vistas of Dar es Salaam and turning it into a well livable and modern city. We have the Dar es Salaam Metropolitan Development Program. Um, this is funded by the World Bank and it aims to strengthen urban services, infrastructure, but also make Dar es Salaam resilient to uh, climate change effects. Um, it has really helped in terms of connectivity and increase the resilience of the city. We also have the Dar es Salaam Bus Rapid Transit, commonly called uh, DAT, funded by the African Development Bank Group. And this is a loan to finance the second phase of the BRT. We've, we've completed the first phase and this was a loan to finance the second phase. And we have had immense improvements in connectivity, reduced commuting and transport costs, especially for people uh, living in peri-urban areas. We also have the housing finance project, uh, which is funded by the World Bank. Um, the aim is to develop mortgage market, housing microfinance, and expand affordable housing supply. Um, most of the houses are accessed by middle income earners. Um, they are able also to take long-term mortgages, loans, because they have regular incomes. But then um, people who have irregular incomes, the 70% who are poor cannot really access um, these uh, mortgages. Even the microfinance um, institution loans are a little bit difficult to access because they also need to be serviced by regular incomes. But like I said, these large infrastructure programs are making a significant impact on improving the environment of Dar es Salaam. Next, please. Um, the community project that I talked about earlier, the Hana Nassif project, and I said that this is a, it's, it, while it's a project that was implemented uh, some years ago, but it did a lot to improve this, the, the, the environment of Dar es Salaam. Now, the project was funded by, ex, heavily funded by external uh, partners. Uh, for instance, the community provided their labor. Um, local government also contributed in terms of expertise, et cetera. So um, funding was really skewed towards uh, external funding. Uh, but however, these programs were small, they targeted livelihoods, they also engaged communities. Uh, it improved the environments, like I said earlier, and the livelihoods of the community, uh, but also women were empowered. The only big challenge was scaling up. This project was done in Hanasana Sif, but it was not scaled up. The process or the approach, the labor-based uh, technology, labor-based intensive approach was not scaled up to other areas. Next, please. Uh, so uh, this is the cities we envision. I was just trying to reiterate, um, despite the small, interventions and the big interventions. The idea is to improve our cities. Next, please. But then there's a reality that we are all living with in our uh, African cities. Next, please. So in terms of reflection, um, looking at uh, what we aspire, the visions we aspire, and what is actually happening on the ground, uh, what I can say is that often development aid make enormous contributions to city development projects in Dar es Salaam and Africa at large. At this scale, when you have these large infrastructure projects, local urban authorities play a significant role. For example, in the DMDP project, that is the Dar es Salaam Metropolitan Development Project, it is anchored under the municipal councils, and it also contributes significantly to modernizing the city. But sometimes new plans and infrastructure projects sweep away the poor, 
or are largely detached from the reality of 70% of the Dar es Salaam's population. Small scale grants and aid are significant at community level. We often have NGOs and CBOs implementing the projects that are funded by international NGOs and private foundations. However, uh, often governments are reluctant to allow international organizations to work directly with local organizations, understandably because of accountability and transparency issues. Next, please. We've seen that in Dar es Salaam, a number of projects at small scale in the communities, for instance, Chamazi and Hana Nassif, have registered meaningful success at local level. Now, this is typical of many successful community projects in African cities. Of course, there are some that are not successful, um, that have probably ended up midway, but those that are successful make an insignificant impact um, in the community. And like I said, many are not re replicated, the challenges in scaling up these projects, but also there is need to create long-term outcomes to get technical and political will in order to learn and change, to adopt innovative and non-conventional interventions that often have external funding. Not every one of us as professionals want to embrace or adopt innovative and non-conventional interventions um, because sometimes they go against what we've been taught um, in class. Next, please. So what I'm saying is there are no clear pathways to the future development of African cities. The kind of cities we imagine is, well, it's still not clear because we have a lot of visions that we aspire we have the sustainable city, the just city, the smart city, but we are yet to forge our own identity that builds or reflects the realities of our residents and their everyday lives. And this is quite complex. We have poverty, we have climate change, we have issues related to globalization. So the path is complex, but requires not only integrated context sensitive solutions, but also partnering and networking of national, international stakeholders, but most importantly, putting poor men and women at the center of urban development. We need to reduce the gap between teaching, research and practice. And as an academician, I think this is very important. At our university where I work, with help from CEDA, we're making great strides in this aspect. Um, some of the results include we have over 60 staff that have been trained in PhD, but we were also able to develop a university research agenda that among others aims to ensure that our results are translated into policy as well as solutions that are relevant, context sensitive um, at the community level. So this I think is very important. I think this is the last of, uh, of my slides. Okay, thank you um, for listening. Thanks, Tatsu, for that yeah. very interesting presentation. Um, I will uh, now, you know, open the floor for uh, discussion. And as I indicated in, in the beginning, uh, questions should come through the question and answer window there, not the chat. So we, we've gotten uh, some questions already. Uh, and I think I will start. I have a few. Um, I think we'll do this for the rest of the time we have. Um, Tatsu, would you say that uh, the urban planning uh, or the development that we see in the cities have continued uh, you know, with, the, with the same rules that created them? you know, in the past. Now, looking at the historic perspective there, would you say that it has just been, you know, uh, evolving with the same, you know, rules and structures that were there in the past, I would say the past being the colonial past. Uh, and, and as you reflect on that, um, I would like to also know how the master plans have changed uh, since that period uh, in terms of inclusion uh, and poverty 
uh, eradication, especially but, you know from the independence to Ujama era and so on to date. And then uh, on this aspect of informality, seventy percent. Uh, living in informal conditions. We may want to throw some light on what we we, we would put in that informal. Um, is this uh, pertaining to secure tenure? Is this also uh, taking into consideration aspects of basic uh, service delivery and so on and so forth? So those two questions are, uh, you know, from me. And there is a question from the chat as well, but I will, I think, let you go ahead with this. And I think Jonas also has something and then we can, we'll return to that. Okay, thank you, Nelson. I didn't uh, get your uh, second question about the informal settlements. You talked about secure tenure and basic service delivery. Yeah, uh, that, that, you know, 70% that mm -hmm. you indicated that is informal in, yes. in, in that. Yes. Um, I would like to know what is, you know, in, contained in that informality. How would you describe that? You know, I, I, secure tenure is an example of basic service delivery. Are these people having secure tenure? Uh, how do they get access to basic services? Okay. Um, you, your, your first question on urban planning and development, have they continued with the same rules? How have they evolved with the same uh, rules since colonial um, times? or have they changed? Um, what I can say is that, for instance, our first uh, master plan was prepared in 1948. I think we had another one in 68, then 74. And now um, for some, a very long time, we didn't have a master plan until now we have the 2012, 2032 uh, master plan. Now, after independence, when we had our master plan, um, of course, the master plan was prepared by uh, a consultant from Europe, um, but at the, the, the planners were able to influence um, how the master plan was, because um, if you can see some of the uh, proposals in the master plan um, were related to our values then, Uyama and uh, self-help housing and self-built housing. Uh, we even had... Um, we, we even had neighborhoods where the plot size plots would look into an open area to reflect some of the communal living that we had um, in the villages. So what I'm trying to say is that the master plan sort of uh, mimicked or reflected uh, the values that uh, we had. But as time went on until now, uh, the master plans have still been prepared by um, consultants from, um, from outside. Um, but unfortunately, despite the fact that they're good master plans, they're zoning and they're supposed to guide the city, rapid urbanization has overtaken um, the, 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 the implementation of this master plan. So there's a mismatch between um, what we envisage in the master plans and uh, what we have, what is happening now. Also the master plans have changed because um, the kind of vision that we have some of is, similar to um, towns like Dubai, um, you know, towns in the West. So sometimes these master plans do not uh, match the reality. Maybe because uh, when they are prepared, um, how can I say it? When they're prepared, the, the, the level of um, participation is not that much. So because with high participation, then you're able to reflect um, what is happening um, on the ground. Um, so sometimes they are, instead of being inclusive, they are rather exclusive. They maintain the zoning in terms of high, um, medium, low um, density areas. And uh, most of the poor people cannot afford to live in this area. So they resort to living in informal settlements. Uh, but when we talk about informality in Dar es Salaam, it's a little bit different from informality in other big cities in Africa. While we have 70% living in these areas, they are mixed, middle income, um, low income people living in these areas. Um, in terms of tenure, you can say tenure is perceived as secure because people buy this land from uh, customary tenure holdings. For instance, if I would like to live in informal settlements, I can buy land from uh, 
someone holding that land under customary tenure systems. Um, some of these, you have basic services delivered there that are almost um, the same as formal areas. So what I can say is that the informality here is actually the process that for acquiring the land, it goes alongside the planned uh, process of acquiring land. So this is what um, the informality that is reflected in these settlements. Thanks, Tatu. Um, I will uh, quickly read through. We have two comments now, and these I can see are all coming from Adi. Uh -huh. um, yeah, uh, and then I will uh, hand over to Jonas to to write to say something. So, uh, Said Nuhu uh, writes, uh, Dr. Tatu, the government comes uh, with different project called uh, affordable houses or housing. But in reality, they are not affordable to the majority. First, how African countries, especially Tanzania, can come up with housing projects which can be affordable to the majority. Uh, second, how those housing projects can reflect the Swahili tradition. As many of established house projects adopted Western or Middle East structures uh, that actually reflects what you just said uh, about the urban planning. And finally, uh, what are the contribution of academia in affordable housing? Mm -hmm. so, so those are three questions for you there. Okay. And then is there is, there is uh, just read this one also from, uh, from our fonts, I think. Uh, could you also make a comment on policy interventions um, in addressing this, the problem. Could you? Okay. Um, to answer Saidi's questions, um, the, he talks about um, affordable housing, that when we have projects, we do like the projects that I showed, they are called affordable housing, but in reality, they are not affordable um, to the majority. This is very true because um, these houses cost almost $23,000 and, 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 and a normal uh, low income person cannot afford. Now the challenge here is in, um, the challenge here is in how these, um, the challenge is in how these housings are being uh, constructed. They are being constructed by the National Housing Corporation, which is the biggest public agency for constructing the houses. Now the National Housing Agency tells that when they construct the houses, they need to buy land, they need to buy building materials, et cetera, just as a real estate um, institution might need to. So they cannot afford to put the housing at a very low um, affordable price because of the inputs that are into the housing. They makes, it makes them quite expensive. So rather than do that, maybe, the government could offer subsidies to such a national housing corporation, or instead of buying land like uh, on market-based prices, maybe they could get also um, some subsidized land. Um, Saidi also talked about, um, what was his, uh, his other question? Swahili culture. Uh, the Swahili Israeli culture, yeah. Yes. Um, in fact, when, when the National Housing Corporation, for instance, when it was built or established in 1962, they built affordable housing um, for uh, civil servants. And this housing actually mimicked um, the Swahili culture where you had um, a courtyard and uh, the facilities like sanitation facilities on the outside and kitchens on the outside. So this kind of mimics the values um, that were there then. But then uh, right now you have uh, housing, like the housing that are built by the National Housing Corporation, they are modern type housing. And I would imagine if they were to build housing that were not so modern, maybe they might not get um, they might not get people to buy this housing because as countries progress, you have the middle class coming up 
And this middle class usually has their own demands and types of, of housing. So now there's a mismatch between catering for um, low income population and also catering for the growing uh, middle class. So rather than have a big institution providing housing, maybe these other housing projects that I talked about at local level um, could also be supported. Thank you. And then lastly, the contribution of academia. Just briefly, I think we have three other questions and then I think Jonas, we'll just do a last round because we have five minutes before we close. Uh, we'll go to your closing remark. So- um, I withdraw. Some, okay. Something about the contribution of academia and then I'll read the other questions. Um, academia, uh, the contribution of academia is in, um, we do a lot of research here at, for instance, even here at the Institute, we do a lot of research. We try to find solutions to the problems that are in the community. Um, sometimes the only uh, challenge that we have in trying to translate these results into really, um, how do you say, back, projects that can really be implemented in, in, in the community, projects that can receive buy-in from, for instance, from the, lo uh, from the local governments. But then we also need to know how to uh, prepare these projects so that they can be um, taken up uh, by small, small communities. We do them on a small scale, but we're not able to scale them up so that the community can also do that. So I think, yes, academia has a very big role in translating research results so that they can be picked up by the community. All right, and then that on policy interventions. So um, that's from Alphonse. Um, policy interventions, what was the question? Yeah, could you also make a comment on policy interventions in actually addressing the problem? Um, for instance, in policy intervention, again, it also depends on, um, for instance, if, we as researchers, we provide um, solutions to the to the problems in the in, in, in society. Now we have to package the solutions in such a way so that policymakers are able to provide uh, are able to buy in um, to the solutions to these problems. The only problem sometimes is um, you need to have political will. And everybody has their interest in the type of problems or in the types of solutions that we provide. So you need to really have a political will and the need and the and the, and the need to be able to put these policies and put these uh, interventions into practice. Thanks, Tatsu. I will uh, read through the three last questions here um, from Charlie. In many countries, the field of energy planning transport planning, public health planning, urban planning remain fairly separate from each other. Mm -hmm. This leads to cities that are less livable and less sustainable than they should be. Uh, is the new master plan in Tanzania making efforts to bring these fields together? Can you discuss? Um, Emmanuel writes, how have uh, the politics of urban planning affected human security in general? Regarding the cases of areas like Mbweni, which has experienced the impacts of unregulated resident patterns in the current years. And then Howard writes, I miss the linkage between all the key players in the housing sector mentioned in the presentation, including government, academia, and communities. What we are missing is the partnership with private sector. So over to you, uh, a couple of minutes. Okay. Um... Shall, um, the, the question by Charlie on um, the, the, the missing link and uh, not the missing link that these public health planning and urban planning remain fairly separated from each other. Um, yes, we have a fragmented planning, um, but then in the new master plan, we're trying to, uh, even during the process of preparing this master plan, there was a special um, effort to bring together the different um, the different sectors so that they can uh, present the master plan so that they can contribute um, towards uh, the master plan. And then we have Emmanuel, I think we have, uh, time is almost running. Um, the politics of urban planning affected human security in, in, in general. 
um, when he talks about um, unregulated residential patterns in the current years. Yes, um, Mbweni has experienced impacts of unregulated residence patterns, but also we have had um, the 20,000 plots uh, that has uh, been done in Mbweni in order to try and uh, provide plots um, that are planned. Of course, sometimes when you have people building in uh, air reserve areas, for example, or areas that are uh, designated for other government um, um, developments, then there's a possibility of these areas being demolished and people being evicted and uh, livelihoods being disrupted. Uh, private sector, when engaged right from the beginning, may be able to bring in innovation in terms of financing and affordable housing. This is very true. Uh, this is how from Zambia, this is very true. And indeed, uh, we're having, we're going to have a very big wash, workshop in about three weeks to come by the National Housing Corporation, trying to look into how the private sector can contribute um, into housing development. They call it the public-private uh, partnership uh, conference. So I agree with uh, the, the statement by Hawa. Yes. Um, thanks, uh, Tatsu. I think we will uh, stop there. Um, th there are many other questions, uh, you know, coming up, but I think for the sake of time, we need to close. Um, just thanking uh, you again for a very interesting presentation and thanking oh. the. The, the participants for joining and for asking very engaging questions. So over to you, Jonas, for closing. Okay. Thank you very much. Asante sana, Tatu. It yes. was a very good uh, illustrated case you presented. And I think what you really pointed at is the need for inclusive and sustainable development. And I think both your presentation and this seminar is a very good example of that. As Nelson said in the introduction, you're the first South participant in this type of dialogue seminars. And I think this point forward to having more of this type of inclusive and sustainable ways of organizing seminars, where we actually could bring in perspective from South in the North in a sustainable way. Like, of course, it's much more fun if we meet in person, but this is a good, a good uh, supplement to that. Uh, and of course, that's also a matter, as you pointed out very well in your presentation, that the lack of, of inclusive participation in the planning process. And I think you illustrated that very well with the discrepancy between the visions of where to take the city and the local reality and, and the gap in between there. And you gave, which I also think is a very good uh, argument for this type of seminars. You gave a very concrete example also of successful ways of dealing with this gap. It is possible. There are experiences out there on how to do that. The challenge is, as you pointed very well at, of course, we know from the not only the, the recent census in, in Tanzania, but also from the, the recent published figures about how the world population is, is developing. That Tanzania is, is one of the eight countries that contribute most to population development in, in on a global scale the, the next few years. So, of course, this is a big challenge. How to scale up this type of projects? And I think that you also addressed in an interesting way in the end, pointing at the need for more close collaboration between on the one hand research uh, and the political process, as well as bringing in civil society and community-based organizations. And also I think, which you didn't go very much into, but I'm sure you haven't time to take up everything. Of course, it's also a need to bring in local government and local government structures in, in in the planning process, which is a challenge. I've been working in Kinondoni district for many field works, and I know how challenging it is to manage all this rapidly growing population and all the needs and then the housing uh, challenge. So I think this was a really interesting uh, and hopefully a start of a dialogue on these type of issues. And I think uh, I really like your point about technical will. And I think that links very well also to the Swahili qu culture question. I think that's really also an interesting way of thinking. How could you, how could you use traditional knowledge, how to build houses in tropical climates in a sustainable way? I mean, many of the houses you showed us examples that is in 
is planned for needs a lot of energy in order to cool down. You need to have uh, air condition instead of having the traditional way of, of cooling them down. So thank you very much for that uh, presentation. <clears throat> very interesting. I'm going to Tanzania on Tuesday. I, I'm looking forward. I will look at Dar es Salaam with new eyes after this. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's a lot of good examples coming from Tanzania and, and Africa in general. And we have much more to learn from each other through having this type of, of dialogue. So Asante Sana, and also Asante Sana to all of you out there in, in the world, in the audience. And let's they say in Tanzania, Karibu Tena, welcome back again to the three yes, network seminars, dialogue series. Uh, and as is written in this chat by Rosanna, you see the, the link to Sweden, follow the news. There will be new exciting seminars coming up and let us keep the dialogue running in an inclusive and sustainable way. Thank you very much, all participants and all panelists. Yeah, thanks. And uh, bye. Thank bye. you very much. Yeah, bye-bye.